Hi, this is Greg from Structural Toolkit, and in this video we're going to go through how to design a cantilever masonry retaining wall. Using Toolkit, we can design a masonry retaining wall by using the retaining wall and masonry member design modules. The retaining wall module allows us to check a design against sliding, overturning and bearing. The module will also provide an ultimate moment at the top of the footing, which can then be used in the masonry member design to check the bending moment capacity of the wall. The masonry member design can also be used to check shear and axial capacity as needed. In this video, we'll go through an example of a reinforced block cantilever retaining wall that forms part of some backyard landscaping near a site boundary, and so it won't be fixed into any other kind of structure. Our retaining wall will be 1.2 meters high and use 190 mm block work. We'll say our geotech has given us a fan in depth of 400 millimeters, and at this depth, we get a bearing capacity of 120 kPa. Along with this, the soil parameters on site will consist of an internal angle of friction of 28 degrees, a soil weight of 18 kilonewtons per meters cubed, and a cohesion of zero. So firstly, we'll open up a retaining wall design. The general idea behind this module is that it will check a retaining wall of a certain geometry against overturning, sliding, and bearing where the active and passive soil pressures are determined by Rankine theory. This module doesn't go into any global failure mechanisms, such as slope stability failure. As with most modules, the first section of our module is our design geometry. For the first input, we have our retaining height, where we can put our height of 1.2 meters, as we discussed earlier. Next, we'll have the risk class and backfill type. Risk class comes from table 1.1 of AS4678 with further details in Appendix A. And backfill type comes from Table 5.1a. They will affect your minimum surcharge KPA, the soil uncertainty factor, and also the design factor. We'll see these in action further down the module. If we look at Table A1 of AS4678, we can see that a wall on a private property supporting gardens or fences is suitable for Class A. But as we discussed earlier, we are going to be close to a site boundary, so it is probably more appropriate to set it as Class B as on the other side of the site boundary may be a structure of some kind. Engineering judgment will need to be used here to determine what class is suitable on a case-by-case -case basis. For our backfill type, we'll select Class 1 Controlled Fill. We would just need to remember to make this backfill requirement clear on our structural drawings, otherwise the design assumption may not be correct. AS4678 has some details on backfill composition. Next we have our soil parameters, where we can input the parameters our geotech provided us being a 28 degree internal angle of friction, leaving our soil weight as 18 and cohesion as zero. We'll say the incline of our soil behind the wall is zero for our example, but you must consider the site slope as this has a direct effect on the active pressure. The incline also affects our live load, where we can see from table 4.1, the required live load will depend on the slope with steeper slopes reducing the required live load surcharge. As for our friction coefficient, this will depend on the type of soil under your footing but a commonly used value is the tan of our internal angle of friction, which if we look to the right is 0.532 in our case. So we'll put it in as that. Further below this, we have some options for the passive soil pressure on the footing, where we can either negate passive pressure entirely, enter a manual KP value, or ignore a certain amount of soil depth, which could be useful depending on your site conditions. We'll leave these three as they are, and then below we can put in our bearing pressure of 120 kPa. Under this, we then also get some options to add additional soil or slab thickness above our footing in front of the wall. This will add extra weight, providing additional restoring moment. To the right, we have our wall geometry, which we can leave as 190 mm thickness and also 1.2 meters for the height. There are also extra options to provide additional wall thickness for a set amount of height in front or behind the wall, which can be useful in certain design scenarios. As our wall is a masonry block wall, we'll set its self weight as 20 kilonewton per meters cubed. Finally, we have our footing geometry. Here we will leave our footing depth as 400. The end thickness can allow for a tapered end, which will reduce the depth of the point of rotation. This will reduce the lever arm to the soil pressure when determining overturning moments. For our design, we'll leave it as zero. We'll put in a tentative footing length of 1000 and come back and optimize it later. Next, we have our overhang, being the length of the footing behind the wall. Using it will likely depend on how feasible it is to construct on site, depending on many factors such as vicinity to a site boundary, 
whether you're cutting in to install the wall or filling behind it. Where feasible, it can be used to provide significant overturn and resistance, or in other words, restoring moment, as it will have a larger lever arm than the rest of the footing and also benefit from the weight of the soil above to provide even more force. We'll say for our design that we are cutting into the site and are close to a site boundary, as we discussed earlier. So we'll just use a normal 100 millimeters overhang. The last set of inputs for our geometry are then the key below the footing, which can help with sliding resistance. Depending on the critical design case, it may be useful to include this. We'll come back to this later after we've worked out all our design forces. The next section in this module is the design loads. Firstly, we have the surcharge load, which for class B needs to be a minimum of 5 kPa in our case. We'll say boreholes from the Geotech showed that the water table is below our footing depth, and so we'll leave our water height as zero. In here, we can also change the load factors if needed. It's interesting to note here that the load factors from AS4678 section 4.1 override the standard load factors of AS1170.0 from section 4.2.2. We also then get additional loads at the top of the wall, being horizontal or vertical. To the right, we also have a calculator for fence loads, similar to that of our sleeper wall design module, which we spoke about in our concrete sleeper retaining wall video. For our design, we can leave these all as default. Next, we have the material design factors. We saw these earlier when talking about risk class and backfield type. Here we can see the factors brought in here. Below this we have our KA and KP values calculated based on ranking theory. The design factors we have in this section modify the design cohesion and design internal friction, resulting in higher factors of safety when the risk class increases. For an internal friction of 30 degrees and horizontal backslope, ranking theory results in a KA of 0.333, a value a lot of people are probably familiar with. However, the application of AS4678 means that this will not be the case. If we temporarily set our internal angle to 30 and scroll back down, we can see that our KA equals 0.351. If we were then to set all our safety factors to 1 by going over to the notes to the right here, and can then see the actual calculation using rank theory arriving at 0.333. To stay with our design, we'll then revert back to the way we had it. The first part of the design load calculation is the design moment in the wall. We get a table here that summarizes the type of loads that are then calculated out into thrust forces in working automatic loads and then moment forces based on a determined lever arm. All the forces here are per meter length of wall. The moment to the bottom right represents the ultimate moment at the top of the footing and will be what we will use to check our wall's moment capacity. The next two sections cover the overturning and restoring moments. The overturning forces are of the same basis as the ones used for the moment in the wall. However, this time the lever arm is based on the point of rotation of the retaining wall footing system. This point of rotation is from the bottom left corner of the footing. However, where the effective eccentricity of the applied loads is outside the current, being greater than the footing length divided by 6, the point of rotation is taken at the centroid of the triangulated bearing pressure near the edge of the footing. This reduction can be set back to the end of the footing using the option in the notes should you want to override this approach, which we can see up here to the right, where if you would want to revert it back to the bottom left corner, you would just delete the value in this cell. We'll see more information on this value down below later. With this point of rotation, two sets of moments, overturning and restoring, are calculated and summarized in the two tables we can see here. The overturning ratio is then based on whether the restoring moment outweighs the overturning moment and is shown down here and also in the summary at the top. Next we have our sliding calculation, where the ultimate thrust force is compared against the total sliding resistance, being based on the passive soil resistance on the footing and key, and also the friction coefficient multiplied by the total weight. Finally we have the bearing capacity check, which determines the maximum and minimum bearing pressure based on theory by Hosking which relies on whether the effective eccentricity of the total weight is inside or outside the kern as to which set of formulas are used. Here we get details on what the point of rotation is based on if the eccentricity is outside the kern, which in our case we can see it is. So now that we have gone through all of the sections, we can go back to the top and see what kind of footing geometry we will require. We can see at the moment that both our overturning and sliding checks fail. As our sliding appears to be failing by the most, that's probably where we'll want to focus. 
Instead of just making the footing longer or deeper, what we can do instead is create a shear key under the footing. By doing this instead, hopefully we'll save on volume of concrete. Just note that a key may not be necessary if there is paving preventing that sliding or the footing is tied into another structure. So what we'll try is having a key start from the end of the overhang, so 100 millimeters from the right face of the main footing. You should be aware that if the key is too close to the toe, this will increase the depth of rotation, increasing the overturning. Over to the right, we have some details on what key position will affect the rotation depth, but as we haven't put a key depth in yet, this won't mean anything to us at the moment. To make sure it doesn't turn into a flexural member, we'll want to keep it wider than it is deep. One geometry that will work in this case is a depth of 250 and a length of 500. This gets our sliding check to work, and with the added weight of the key providing additional restoring moment, our overturning is satisfied as well. With that done, the retaining module part of the design is complete. So what we can do now is take our moment in the wall and do a masonry block wall design. We can see up at the top in the summary that the moment in our wall is 4.5 kilonewton meters. So what we'll do now is open up a masonry member module. We went through this module before in our masonry wall and footing design video. So we won't spend too much time going through all the inputs here. Last time we designed a reinforced double brick wall, but this time we're going to be using block work. So the first thing we'll do is select our 190 block. We'll then click on the grouted and reinforced buttons to input some defaults. We'll be grouting all cores for this example, and so the default input will be fine. As for our reinforcement, we'll see if we can get N12s at 600 centers to work. So the next thing we'll want to do is move on to our geometry tab. For our wall, it will be free at the top and rotational at the bottom. And we'll say that both of the sides are also free. We can then put in our height of 1200 and we'll say that our wall is five meters long. As we are only checking the bending capacity of this wall, we can skip the next few tabs at the bottom. The fire allows us to do a fire resistance period check. The first three comp, bending and shear are for unreinforced masonry design and the final three are for reinforced masonry design. So we're interested in the R bending tab. In here we can put in our bending moment of 4.5 kilonewton meters per meter. And as we are not checking for earthquake, we'll turn off the ductility check. We can see in our summary that our moment is actually greater than the one we've input here. And this is because there is actually another moment coming from the R comp tab that is based on the axial force times a minimum eccentricity. So what we can do is go to the R comp tab, we'll reduce this down to 10 kilonewtons per meter. And if we go back to the R bending tab, we can see we're now designing using 4.5 kilonewton meters. The error we get at the top effectively means that we do not meet the minimum steel requirements for the reinforced compression design. So it will revert to that of an unreinforced capacity, which will be fine. As we can see in our case, our block wall is comfortably taken the design moment. And with that, our design is complete. That about covers all you need to know for designing a cantilever masonry retaining wall in Toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching.